right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lara. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us for Rain Gardens 101. Get your lawn a job. Your lawn just sits there looking pretty day in and day out while you slave after it, working hard. What is it doing for you? Well, uh, we're going to find out today how a rain garden will help you get more out of your lawn and landscape, solving problems at your home, whether it's water in your basement, uh, icy sidewalks, lawn that's so wet you can't mow it for three months out of the year, solving problems like attracting pollinators, birds, butterflies, bees to your yard, solving community problems, flooded streets, flooded sidewalks, flooded rivers, polluted rivers. Rain gardens are the gold standard for environmental landscaping. It is the best way for you to make a difference right in your own backyard. And I am thrilled for the opportunity today to share it with you all about the joys of rain gardens. So let's kick this thing off. Um, let's see, I think, yep, I think our screen is sharing. So Rain Gardens 101, um, thank you first of all to our uh, funder for this event today, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We're grateful for them making this event possible. And um, as a reminder, there are door prizes associated with this event today. So something to look forward to. Let's see if I can make this, there we go. We've got a rain barrel starter kit and a native plant kit, as well as a copy of local Rouge author, Sally Wenzel's Let's Build a Rain Garden children's book. So exciting things to look forward to. Stay tuned until the end to find out how to enter. Uh, our agenda for today, what is a rain garden? Why would you do a rain garden? Rain Smart, which is all the resources that you're gonna need to move forward at your home or to hire a contractor. Where, where at your home is the right place for a rain garden? And lastly, how um, sizing a rain garden, digging a rain garden, planting a rain garden, an overview on all of these essential topics for you. So you'll hopefully come away having a roadmap for how you can proceed, how you can get the resources you need to be successful. Uh, a little bit about Friends of the Rouge. Friends of the Rouge is a nonprofit organization founded in 1986. We're located in Southeast Michigan. You can see the white outline on the map over there. Those are the lands that drain to the Rouge. Red is urban areas. This is one of the most urbanized rivers in Michigan, in the United States. And uh, the Rouge has seen uh, difficult times in the past. Uh, we've talked about this the last three days leading up to Earth Day today about how the river was one of our most polluted rivers, uh, caught fire in 1969. It's a river that's given so much. It built the Ford Model T, built the automobile, gave that as a gift to the world. Uh, helped to create the arsenal of democracy through World War I, World War II. Um, and uh, because of it catching fire in 1969, that's partially what helped um, trigger the creation of the Clean Water Act, which in turn helped to clean up much of the problem with the Rouge. Not all the problems, but you can see on that top right photo, folks kayaking the industrial stretch of the Rouge. You can see the Ford Rouge plant in the background right there. So you can see the river has come so far from those bad old days. We can get back on the river, we can recreate and I am so proud to say that we are now at Friends of the Rouge working to build the Lower Rouge Water Trail, 27 mile stretch of canoeing, kayaking right here in Southeast Michigan. Um, Pure Michigan should not be a four hour drive away. You should have it right in your own backyard. And together we are working to make that happen. And your efforts to create a rain garden are such an important part of that. We've got a goal of 1000 rain gardens by 2025 as we work towards restoring the Rouge River. So your efforts at home are solving problems for you and solving problems for the river itself. And uh, this is just to situate ourselves, a reminder, it is Earth Week. Today is Earth Day. Uh, there have been so many Lunch and Learns this week. We can catch you up if you missed any of them. There are still opportunities after today. Tomorrow, tree plantings. Uh, we are planting, I think it's about 18,000 seedlings in the Lower Rouge, tons of other opportunities. You can visit therouge.org to find out what more you can do as a part of Earth Day. We welcome you to join us. Um, so again, what, why, rain smart, where, how, we're going to move into what now, what is a rain garden, and I will pause actually brief housekeeping, feel free to type your questions into the chat in the Q&A, Q&A is best by far, I'm going to be moving a little quickly today, and I want to be able to tap into that Q&A to make sure all questions are answered, and if you're on Facebook, feel free to type in your questions as well there, and Laura can help get them to me through that Q&A, so um, feel free to type them whenever you've got the questions, and we'll get to them when there's a good pause point. 
So first, what is a rain garden? I love this photo. Just, hey, it's, it's a gorgeous photo. But also, I love making y'all guess where the rain garden is in this picture. And I will pause for a sec, and we will try to connect through the ether. I will hear you all magically where you're shouting out to the screen for where the rain garden is. And uh, the answer, it's a trick question. There are actually two rain gardens in this picture. There is uh, one in the foreground area. Um, where my mouse is circling. And then there's actually one in the back. It's connected, it's piped in. So two rain gardens that fit perfectly into this beautiful designed backyard space. So a rain garden can fit into any landscape. What's a rain garden? It is a whole lot of fun, a family project, all ages included, digging in the dirt in your own backyard and solving problems. Uh, here, a little more technically about a rain garden. I get people all the time that come up to me, they say, Matthew, I have a rain garden. I've got a garden and it rains on it. It's a rain garden, right? Well, it's a little bit more, a little more to it than just that. A rain garden is certainly going to get the water that's falling on it. It's also going to get the water that is flowing off of a hard surface. Typically at homes, the roof is the, the primary source, but it could be from your driveway, from a sidewalk, uh, anything like that. Any of those hard surfaces, they don't soak up the water anymore. Those are the sources of most flooding in our community as those hard surfaces, the water flows off of your house, flows off of your driveway, floods the street, gets into the sewer system, you know, uh, causes you know, basement backups, uh, floods the rivers and so on and so forth. And so a rain garden is a way for you to capture that water at your home. And so you're taking responsibility for your water that's falling in your property. Now, it's also a great way to make your home work better. We can get the water farther away from your home's foundation. So we're helping to keep your basement dry. We're picking where the water goes in your landscape. So you're drying out other lawn areas. You're picking where the wet area is and you're putting in plants that can handle the water. So a rain garden is just a great functional landscape. And as you'll see, it can be quite attractive. Here's a sample. Uh, this is at the Plymouth Municipal Yard. And I'm sure you all agree with me that it's got an incredibly attractive front entryway. I know, uh, Plymouth wanted to fix that. And uh, they also had a problem to solve with water. This is a huge roof and water would flow out of the downspouts that you can see in the right side of the picture. And it would cause icing every winter time. And so they wanted to solve two birds uh, or what, does it kill two birds with one stone? That's not a great metaphor, is it? Um, with a rain garden. And so here is what we ended up doing. We carved out a bunch of asphalt. We dug down about nine inches deep. We piped those downspouts into it. And so it fills up with water and it drains dry in about two hours. They've got beach sand, the perfect, perfect soils for rain gardens that are highly functional. And it looks great. Here is what it looked like two years after the planting with orange butterfly weed in full bloom um, and uh, other great texture plants around it. So gorgeous front entryway now. That rain garden solves a lot of problems. Here is my second sample rain garden for you. This is Anne House's residence. And uh, she had a problem with an unmobile lawn space. The swale between her and her neighbor's home would get so wet that she could not mow it until July every year. And so she wanted to use a rain garden to solve it. And so where there's that existing island in the front, we basically replaced that island with a rain garden and we piped the water from the front of her house to that rain garden to soak it up. There is Anne celebrating the garden a year after completion. And you can see just beautiful Michigan native plants in bloom there, the red cardinal flower, the yellow goldenrod, and the irises creating great texture in the front. And in the bottom, you can see a pop-up emitter. That's how the water is getting into that garden. So it's staying out of that grassy swale, drying up that swale, making her home more functional and solving problems for the river. Uh, at the start, we talked about park a little bit, um, Plymouth Arts and Recreation Complex. It's where our headquarters are located. Last year, we spent a whole lot of time building 23 rain gardens across the site, and we had 600 volunteers, maybe some of you on the call, that helped to plant those gardens. Bottom left photo is showing uh, the largest garden after the June rain event, that massive flood causing June rainstorm. You can see it filled to the brim with water. These gardens together soak up over 3 million gallons of storm water every single year. An incredible contribution to flood control here in the Southeast Michigan area. And they are beautiful spaces that support all manner of pollinators, as you can see in the planted garden in the right. 
I invite you, I should say, to come on out and take a tour of park. We are working to make it a self-guided walking tour so you can see all different kinds of rain garden styles. There are 23 gardens, lots of different styles, different pollinators especially uh, that the gardens are designed to attract. So um, what do rain gardens look like? Um, the answer to that is really, well, what do gardens look like? And we all know that there are a lot of different ways for a garden to be a garden in this world, all different kinds of styles, colors, textures. And the reality is a rain garden can be designed to suit your needs and your goals. Uh, here I show you a range of common styles for rain gardens from a grassy texture on the left, which I find works especially well in communities where you know turf is the expectation in the front yard. So you can design your rain garden to sort of match that aesthetic. Uh, in the middle, a manicured style of rain garden. So in formal gardens and landscapes, we can make it work. And then on the right, more of a habitat focused rain garden where you've got a different plant for every square foot in the garden, a wild diversity of native plants supporting birds, bees, and butterflies. I typically recommend for folks, think about your backyard as your best space for habitat focused. It's your own private space. You can do whatever you want and you can get as many birds and butterflies there as you want. The front yard, maybe keep that a little bit more manicured. And that's good because not only is it going to be maybe matching your neighborhood better, but it's also going to be making a better argument to others that they should be doing rain gardens as well. When people see something pretty, they say, oh, what is that? I want some of that too for my yard. So making front yard attractive gardens is a really good strategy for popularizing these, uh, these kinds of rain gardens. But the reality is you can do whatever you want. The garden on the right is a front yard garden in Ann Arbor where you can do that kind of thing. So it's really, it's about what kind of garden works for you. Another common question, what do rain gardens cost? The cost is in a wide range, depending on if you're gonna do it yourself or if you're gonna hire a professional. If you're gonna do it yourself, maybe you take the Master Rain Gardener class. You can see on the left side, it might cost you 350 bucks. But as any gardener knows, you can dig up and divide plants from friend gardeners and many rain garden plants are commonly planted in landscapes. You can get potentially uh, wood chips from a landscape contractor. You can get compost from your municipality, but you might not even need compost. So a DIY rain garden can be free. And then for hiring a professional, the price is very widely, very, very widely, 15 to $30 a square foot is not uncommon. I'd say $15 a square foot probably more typical, but um, you know, you can pay as much as you want for any kind of ring, any kind of garden out there, depending on what kind of hard skate you might want to put around it, how fancy you want to make it. So $15 is a, a decent estimate. So you can see on here for the 100 square foot rain garden, maybe, um, you know, a little bit over uh, $1,600. Uh, another common question I get when we're doing rain gardens is, um, what do I do with all this dirt? So when we're digging a rain garden, we're digging deep down, we're not deep down, we're digging three to six inches down uh, in your soil and there's gonna be leftover dirt afterwards. So that's one of the biggest challenges that folks have to work around when they're building it. So I'm gonna step you through three primary options here to get you thinking about where the dirt might go. And uh, here's a group from Blue Cross Blue Shield that helped me dig a rain garden in Plymouth Township a couple years back. Here you can see we, uh, we talked to a landscape contractor they dropped us off this trailer and we loaded it up with about five cubic yards of soil. That cost us about a hundred bucks to do that. So that's one way to get rid of the soil is just send it off to a landscape contractor. Or next, um, we tried to do what's called balancing the cut and fill. And I'll talk more about that later on. This rain garden, it's at St. Suzanne's in Detroit. It has a berm in the front that sort of mounded uh, it's actually wild strawberry growing all along the front um, after the grass transitions into the rain garden. That's an elevated space. And so we basically piled all the soil up in that front area to use the soil, keeping it on site. So that's another way to do it. We'll talk about how to do that towards the end. And then lastly, uh, a very traditional landscape style is the berm garden. And that's just those raised mounded landscapes. You see them everywhere as you're driving about. Uh, some people actually you know, pay to have soil brought to their house so they can do that. Here's a, a guy I found on the internet, yourgardensanctuary.com showing his efforts to get 10 cubic yards of soil dropped off at his house so that he could haul it into his backyard and make a berm landscape. So maybe you just have a space at your home where you wanna just do that yourself. Maybe you put it out on Craigslist or something like that. Maybe someone will come and get it or maybe you'd have to drop it off at somebody's house, but um, it's another way to use up that soil, uh, to turn that soil into a resource. So um, that's actually, I'd say, probably the biggest barrier for most people is figuring out what to do with the dirt. Um, 
I want you to think about a rain garden as another tool in the toolbox. If you've got water issues, the go-to solution for water issues these days are these things called dry wells on the left. Uh, and just a comparison here, a dry well is gonna hold maybe 20 to 50 gallons of water. I've seen quotes as high as $2,000 to install one of those. And on clay, they do not work. Uh, I have one on my clay garden that was installed before we moved into our house and it is wet all, all, all spring. It doesn't work at all, it doesn't drain. Contrast that with a 120 square foot rain garden. You can see it handles way more water depending on the soils. The number on the left is clay, number on the right is sand. And the price on there can vary pretty widely. We talked about that um, just a few minutes ago. Um, and this is gonna drain. It's gonna drain in less than 48 hours and even on the heaviest of clay soils. And pictured here, she had heavy clay soil. So rain gardens work on clay. So rain gardens are not just good for the environment, but they are a smart landscaping strategy. It's another tool in the toolbox. It is the most impactful, effective drainage solution available. All right, so now we've got a sense for what a rain garden is. I'm gonna give you a story of a rain garden. This is one homeowner's experience with getting a rain garden at her home. Uh, Denise Held uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, she was an early pioneer for rain gardens. It was a grant funded project as Washtenaw County was trying to get demonstrations. And uh, I'm gonna ask you to pay attention to the fence on the left. It's gonna be where the rain garden goes. There's that little red bud shrub in the middle and the big honey locust tree on the right that uh, Harry Sheehan is standing next to. Um, they did a soil infiltration test. They dug 18 inches down, they filled it up with water and they timed how long it would take to drain. Um, guidelines on how to do this in our master rain gardener training manual. Uh, this is our best way to find out what the soils are like and to size the rain gardens. And what they found was that Denise had clay, clay, clay. It did not drain. So that's okay. We can still do rain gardens even on heavy clay soils, but we just know what uh, we just need to plan for it. This is the professional landscape design that came out of it. So on the right side of this drawing is that fence line, the little circle in the middle over here, that's the red bud. And then the big tree on the top is that honey locust. So you can see how it fits nicely into the space with beautiful arcing curves. And then here is what it looked like after it got installed. You can see the blue arrow is where the downspout is piped into the rain garden. That back area is the rain garden. The front area is actually not a rain garden. It's just a pollinator garden, but they were designed together because they just look so great designed in conjunction with each other. It's just the rain garden in the back there. And then here's what it looked like after the plants had a little bit of time to mature. You can see uh, year two in the spring, the hairy beard's tongue blooming. There's some wild geranium in the front blooming, a lot of great texture coming in. in the summer in the right, you can see purple cone flower. You can see um, uh, daylilies in the back, nodding wild onion in the front, some cardinal flower blooming. And then in the fall, you can see some purple um, turtle head, pink turtle head coming in, some old man's beard uh, growing along the fence line. And then late fall, you can see the great reds of the wild geranium coming in, the yellows of the irises in the back. So beautiful, beautiful rain garden. Denise had such a great experience. She decided she wanted more of this. And so she took the master rain gardener training program through which she designed her own next rain garden on a rental property that she owns. Um, and this is showing her design uh, through the master rain gardener class. It's a five part class. You get feedback every step of the way. So you come out with a design that you are confident you can build and that will look great. So this is Denise's design here. She did a very ambitious two tier rain garden which is especially good for a rain garden on a slope. So you can see her lines showing those two tiers. Here is Denise building that rain garden. You can see the upper tier um, brick line. The bottom tier has one of those berms. So she used up some of the soil on that bottom area there. And here's Denise laying out her plants. Denise is a big time gardener. So she actually ended up bringing in a lot of plants from her other gardens. All the ones that are in pots are ones that she dug up. The ones in white are ones that she bought from a native plant nursery in Ann Arbor. So she's laying them out there and getting them planted. And then there she is showing off the fruits of her labor, her beautiful second rain garden. Here is what that rain garden looked like the following spring. You can see beautiful spring color. She planted some irises. She's got pink columbine on it. So a lot of great spring color. And then by late summer of the third year, you can see it is just a flower color show. You can also see that she decided over time she did not like that berm anymore. So she ended up adding a facer to it, more bricks. 
Um, she felt that that looked better in her yard area. So you can see rain gardens, like any gardens, are evolving palettes for you to play with over time. And uh, in this garden, you can see echinacea blooming. You can see, I believe it's Beatrice blooming. Uh, in the back, there's some um, prairie dock. That's the big, bright leaf texture. And it's got eight uh, foot tall flower stalks. It is a beautiful, incredible native plant um, with uh, uh, quite the bloom coming in. All right, so with that, that is our what. We now know what a rain garden is. We've talked about Denise's experience with a rain garden. I'm gonna double check the Q&A. Um, if there's any questions that relate just to the what, I'll answer those now. If there's questions that we'll touch on later on, I'm gonna have them, I'm gonna address them when we get to it. And it's looking like the questions that are in the Q&A, we will get to those. So I'm gonna hold those questions. Um, are there any other questions? I see Scott is asking a question. Scott Morgan, this is a good what's a rain garden question. Is there a difference between a rain garden and a bioswale? So this is a little bit of a technical question. Um, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, bioswale is soaking up water like a rain garden, similar plants, but a bioswale is also designed to convey water. So it's not just gonna fill up with water and sit there. It's gonna fill up with water, but it's also gonna let water pass through on its way to somewhere else. Um, whether it's another rain garden farther downstream, maybe it's going to pass its way to the community drain system. So a bioswell is like a rain garden, but it has that extra function of moving things. And then Scott asks if there are good options to make rain gardens an attractor for pollinators. We'll talk about that. Any other questions? I think we're good. All right, so we're going to keep things moving here. And we'll get to the other Q&As uh, in a little bit. All right, so why? Why would you do a rain garden? Well, the most obvious reason why is you've got problems to solve. Um, water problems. Here is a home. For those of you that have been with us, you know this is my backyard. I moved in in 2017 and was a little surprised that the next spring to find a massive lake in my backyard. Well, I thought, ha, lake. This is the wrong first time homeowner that you're messing with here. Uh, I know what to do about this. And so I had fun during the pandemic. Um, I have two small children, ages three and six now. I did not have time for this. And so I just actually left that puddle there. Um, I'll go back. This puddle was more than 10 feet away from my house. And so it wasn't really a threat to my property. And my children actually like to play in it. So it wasn't a big priority for me to deal with till the pandemic came. And so here you can see in progress rain gardens recently planted in the back where the water was. And you can see other gardens in progress. Uh, the foreground area, you can see a whole new native plant landscape I installed. And to the left, you can see cardboard that I'm laying down, smothering grass, getting ready for another native plant landscape. So I'll go back. You can see there's the before, all lawn, way more lawn than I needed. The after there, I still have a nice concentrated area for lawn so that my daughters can play. But the reality is my daughters are actually playing as much now in the native plant gardens as they were in the lawn. There's lots of hiding places, uh, lots of debris, um, uh, like branches coming down uh, that I'm actually leaving in the landscape as natural play material. So they're having a lot more fun in the yard than they ever did when it was all lawn, which is great. And then moving forward, this is a year later, you can see I completed the native plant gardens in the left and right. I actually dug up 300 square feet of asphalt, which is on the very right side and created another rain garden and uh, and the work just goes on i'm removing a chain link fence removing the trumpet creeper there to open up the space a little bit more so making this a yard that works for me and my family that's using rain gardens to solve problems and integrating them into the landscape other reasons you might want to do a rain garden maybe you've got ice on a sidewalk this is a very common picture right here where people's um, drainage pipes are drained right to the sidewalk the sidewalk is lower water pools, it freezes, it's a hazard uh, in the winter time. You do not want to be this poor guy or you don't want to have this be your neighbor who's tripping um, as they're walking by your home. And so a rain garden can be a great way to keep that water off the sidewalk in your landscape where it's not causing a problem. Other reasons to do a rain garden, you wanna be a leader. This is showing Roger Moon, he's a master rain gardener from 2012. After he built his first rain garden, he built three more at his home. And now he hosts garden club visits regularly. He is a presence on the master rain gardener Facebook group. If you post questions on that, pictures and questions, you will likely see him answering. So he is a leader in the rain garden community now. And you might be someone that sees problems. You wanna be someone that's helping your friends and neighbors to make a difference. 
So those are major reasons to be doing a rain garden. Other reasons, I wanna give you uh, a big picture overview of issues in our community here. Uh, this is showing you know, Southeast Michigan, um, you know, a snapshot of some of the challenges that we are experiencing. Um, I, feel free to type into the chat what you're seeing. I'm gonna kind of pause for a moment, let you take this in. There's a lot happening in here. You might be pointing out the water in the street. You know, we've had issues with flooded streets when we get major storms here in Southeast Michigan. Look at all these homes, look at all the water sitting in so many of these homes. I can't tell you how many people call me with flooding issues in their landscape. Um, you can see in the river itself, it is overflowing from the pipes, significant erosion on the edges of the river. You can see a pollution sheen on the river. And that's coming from all of our homes, from the oils, from our car, um, the brakes, as our brakes are wearing down, there's metals pollution coming off of them, um, fertilizers from our yards, pesticides, all that stuff across our land area washes into the river. And it's the major source of pollution that the Rouge experiences today. Most of the industrial pollution has been cleaned up at this point. So it's all of that water from our homes, our communities, our places of business, our places of worship that are creating the problems for the river at this point today. Other problem that you may or may not see on here is there are not many trees in this picture. Emerald ash borer came in a couple decades ago and wiped out most of our urban trees. And that's part of why we're having these flooding issues as well. So big picture challenge, here is our solution. This is the vision that we're working for here at Friends of the Rouge. And there's a lot that happened here in this picture. You can see trees planted throughout the area. You can see parking lots where the asphalt has been shrunk with more landscape, like what we did at the Plymouth Arts and Recreation Complex, adding in more tree cover. You can see that with all of this change, the river is now running much clearer. There's not as much water flooding in after storms. There's a new canoe and kayak launch built down here, like what we're building along the Rouge now, so that the community can embrace the river. That is the vision that we have for the Rouge, a river that you can enjoy year long, um, right in your own backyard. And you might be saying to yourself at this point, that's a great vision, but who's gonna do that? That's a huge change. Um, that's true, but what I'm gonna do for you now is I'm gonna break it down into the one small piece that you're managing. So we're gonna zoom in on one home. There you go, there's that home right there. Here is the before for that home. Here's the after for that home. You can see the before, that, water, that home dealing with water problems. The after is not that big a change. One rain garden, maybe a second rain garden, a couple trees planted, that's about it. And so when we look at this picture here in the aggregate, when each person does their part at their home to steward their home landscape, to solve problems at their home, it adds up to big change. And it's a change that we can all be a part of as we work towards solving these problems uh, with flooding in our community. You can be a leader in working to address these challenges. Okay, so with that, um, Let's move on. So another why for rain gardens is native plants. Uh, you do not have to use native plants in a rain garden. It's optional. It's your garden. We are a big tent at Friends of the Rouge. Um, we want you to make a rain garden that makes you happy. Whatever it is that makes you happy, uh, building that rain garden is, is the key. Um, but if you're using native plants, you're going to get a lot of extra value coming in. And so first and foremost, native plants tend to work really well in rain gardens. We have a diversity of shoreline species, lake plain species. Michigan was a, was long been a very wet place. Um, plants that are used to um, you know, wet seasons, getting wet and then drying out and dealing with a dry summertime. So uh, those kinds of plants are adapted to both wet and dry. That's the hallmark of a rain garden plant. And so we have a lot of species that work really well in rain gardens and look great. So that's a lot of why we look to native plants. And then the other reason why is that habitat piece. Uh, native plants are critical habitat um, plants. And uh, to understand why, we'll step briefly through this. Um, the monarch butterfly is a great primer on why it is native plants are so essential for habitat. These pictures that you're seeing here, these are the fir forests in Michoacan, Mexico, where the majority of monarchs across North America concentrate every year. That orange dusting on the trees, that is butterflies. 
it is incredible. Down below, you can see what it means for a continent's worth of butterflies to be in one place. It's an incredible life history. And most of us know at this point that it is a relationship that is built upon a plant insect relationship. So the monarch caterpillar is specifically dependent upon milkweed plants um, to raise its larva. That relationship between a plant and an insect uh, is critical. Um, and it's, it's not just monarch butterflies alone. There are many insects that have relationships like that. Here is an example of a double tooth prominent on an elm leaf. And you can see the re relationship on its back, written in on its back, those ridges align with the elm leaf that it's eating. That is the plant that it eats. It, it has a specific relationship with that plant. It is fascinating. Once you start getting into native plants, pollinators, learning about all these things that are happening just right in your own backyard you never would have known of. And the other thing I'll point out about this caterpillar is uh, the white tinges on it. Um, the reason why that caterpillar is white, it is uh, one of many caterpillars that hides from birds by pretending to be bird poop. Uh, there is a whole class of categories, Google it, uh, search for it, you will see so many caterpillars that hide by pretending to be bird poop, it's, it's incredible. Uh, but apart from cool stories about bird poop caterpillars, you might be asking yourself, okay, great, I see that native plants support insects, but do I really care about bugs? Do I really want bugs in my backyard? I'm not sure if I'm willing to go that far. Well, the answer is, if you will care about birds, then yes, you probably want those insects. Caterpillars especially are the most important food source for songbird nestlings. 95% of their um, food source is uh, from caterpillars, is from insect feed. And so when you are planting native plants, you're supporting an ecosystem. It's a foundation for an ecosystem. You're supporting the insects that then support the birds that you wanna see. You're also supporting insects that you might actually wanna see. So native bees, many native bees, have specific relationships with native plants. And there's such a cool diversity of native bees out there. They are mostly, they're not colony bees. They are not stinging bees. They're mostly solitary bees, ground nesting bees, um, non-stinging bees. We've got a sweat bee on the left, a mason bee in the middle, and a bumblebee on the right. Really cool insects um, that have a lot of support as well um, pollinating plants. If you're a gardener, a food gardener, a vegetable gardener, these um, insects are going to be helping increase yields in your garden. And they're also going to be natural pest control against pests that might be eating your garden plant. Um, so with that, I invite you to bring your lawn to life with a rain garden. To get that lawn a job, bring your lawn to life. Here is a hummingbird on a cardinal flower, a great Michigan native rain garden plant. Beautiful. You just don't see reds like that in most garden plants. And you are almost guaranteed to get hummingbirds by planting something like that at your home. So a rain garden is solving so many problems at the same time. All right, with that, that is our why. And uh, now I'm gonna get into, actually I'll check the Q&A and see if there's any other why questions. All right, I'm going to hold off. I don't see any why questions. We're going to move on to Rain Smart. And I will say that um, we're going to go up to one o'clock today and we'll stick around for an extra 15, 20 minutes for questions after that as well. And this is recorded, so you can check it out later on. So, Rain Smart. So, this is your resource, therouge.org slash Rain Smart. Any question you've got, it's my job to get it on that website to show you resources and well, as well as to provide you resources to get off of the website to be talking to someone. So first and foremost on the website, you'll find out about the Master Rain Gardener class. We just finished an online virtual one. We've got our next one coming up in October in Oakland County, location TBD, and it will be in person. So you can sign up for our e-news if you wanna get an announcement for that when it's gonna be time. And uh, taking that class, you can add your name to the Master Rain Gardener Hall of Fame. You can enjoy thousands of homeowners who have designed and built their own rain garden before you. Uh, it's a great community of passionate um, gardeners, environmentalists, people working to make a difference and solve problems. So I invite you to join in that class. You can also find out about um, our roof store. We've got rain barrels for sale now with a May 4th order deadline. We've got native plant kits available as a resource. Um, you'll also find on the RainSmart website lists of contractors that you can be hiring, um, tips and tricks about how to build a rain garden. You'll find access to the Master Rain Gardener training manual. You'll find a link to a Facebook group on which you can ask and get questions answered as well. So all kinds of resources available for you on there. You'll also find on there uh, information about uh, getting consultations. You can hire me or other friends of the Roosh staff to give you an hour long one-on-one -on -one support. 
And uh, if you'd like, you could potentially have a concept design come out of that, or it can just be a consultation, a conversation. So it's another resource available. Uh, so keep that in mind. The rouge.org slash rainsmart is a great follow up with all manner of resources available. Don't see the resource you need. You can also email me afterwards as well to get um, more questions answered. So, so that's rainsmart. Um, I'm going to move on to where. And then I'm going to get into how, and then we'll really dive into the Q&A. Um, we'll see if there's any questions that I've not answered yet at that time. So where to put a rain garden? Um, rain garden, it's like most any other garden out there. So you need space for the garden to be. You need sunlight um, for the garden. In addition, different from other gardens, you need a water source. So whether it's your roof gutters um, or whether it's your driveway or sidewalks or whatever, you need that water source for it to be a rain garden. And you need to keep in mind that water goes downhill. That's one of the key things for siting. So I saw in the Q&A, somebody asked about whether or not you could have water run across the surface into a rain garden. This is showing an answer to that. This is called a swale when you've got a channel basically moving water to a place in the landscape. Somebody asked about bioswales earlier. Swales and bioswales are, um, swales are ways of moving water. And you can, if you've got the slope, use a swale to guide water into a rain garden in addition to piping it. Here is an example of one home that has uh, water coming from a couple sources, a driveway, sidewalks, and uh, there's downspouts at this house. Um, so lots of different water sources and a big open area of lawn. This is the textbook example of where a rain garden can go. The water is naturally sloping towards that lawn anyways and creating problems. And so that homeowner uh, basically dug out that whole front lawn area and created a beautiful large rain garden feature to handle that water. Here's another example. This is a very common example. People have large expanses of lawns without tree cover uh, due to emerald ash borer. Um, this is your perfect example of the kidney-shaped rain garden in the backyard with downspouts getting piped over to it. So very common placement for a rain garden. Sometimes rain gardens will also get put adjacent to driveways. This is Anna Cairns, a master rain gardener from the Livonia area. And she had water icing up on her driveway. So she dug out next to the driveway so the water would flow off and into a rain garden that she dug out. So she was solving her icing problem on her driveway. And here's what that rain garden looked like a year later. Uh, and you can see our beautiful native Michigan flamingo in its natural habitat, in addition to the beautiful garden plants blooming. The Joe Pye weed especially is blooming right now and blue lobelia in the front of the rain garden. Beautiful rain garden. If you are ever redoing your driveway, that is an incredible opportunity to better things with drainage. Here's a garden by Norm Cox. And you can see at the bottom, um, you can see a trench drain that got installed, a great way to capture that water before it leaves your property and it goes into a rain garden uh, next to that trench drain. Thing to keep in mind is again, water goes downhill. So you might have a beautiful, large open lawn area, but if it is uphill from your hard surface, it is just not gonna work. And when it comes to site selection, that's maybe one of the biggest challenges is you've got the water here, but can you get the water there? Where the rain garden is going to go. So a key thing to be looking for. Uh, it just does not work to build it on that back upper area. Another question is about whether or not there's going to be enough sun. Um, the good news is that rain gardens and shade work great. Actually, wet shade is often easier than dry shade to plant. Dry shade is very difficult to plant. Not many plants can survive there, but wet shade works really well. And many of the rain garden plants survive in uh, full shade and will help deal with water problems that are happening in those shady spaces. So this is Ann Harrington's shady rain garden right here. Um, so the reality is, uh, and my apologies to you, once you start getting into this, as you're driving around town, you're going to start seeing places for rain gardens everywhere. Rain garden, rain garden, rain garden, rain garden. There are so many places rain gardens can go. It actually helps for us to think about it in the reverse. Where is it a bad place to put a rain garden? The Hippocratic Oath of a Master Rain Gardener is first do no harm. Make sure that there's enough space, that the slopes are going to work, that there aren't any obstacles or hazards, and that you're planning for an emergency overflow. Uh, so we're going to actually get into a little bit of an interactive component here um, where I'm going to show you a space and ask you whether or not it's going to work. So and you can type in your answer or you can just scream into the screen and I will hear you. Uh, so here's our first one. Is there enough space right here in our green space for a rain garden to go? Pause while you scream, while you type. 
The answer is no, there is not enough space here. This is not a good place for a rain garden. There's utilities right there for one thing. It's within 10 feet of the building, which is a no-no. We wanna to try to keep the water 10 feet away to keep it out of basements. So that's not gonna work. But if you have a narrow area like that, you might be able to pipe it somewhere else. Here's a resident who did just that. She had a very narrow area. And so she piped it to her front yard. You can see right there, she had a lot of open lawn space up there and she had enough slope to make that work. So she was able to move the water around to the right place to be. That can be an excellent strategy. All right, here's our next example. So is this a good place for a rain garden? Scream out or type in the chat. I'll pause for a couple seconds here while you think it through. You can see downspouts coming down. You can see a nice open spot of landscape, a sidewalk, another open spot of landscape. The answer is no, this is not gonna work. It needs to be 10 feet from the house. This section of green space is within 10 feet. This is a risky area to put a rain garden. There's a good chance that water is gonna end up in a basement. Um, some people have successfully drilled under a sidewalk and planted a rain garden in the hell strip here. But in this case, there's a tree there. We don't wanna dig next to that tree. That's uh, likely to damage that tree. So this is not a space that's gonna work for a rain garden, unfortunately. All right, next up, here is a nice open space uh, in the landscape. There's a downspout right here. Is this gonna work for a rain garden? All right, I'm listening in, I'm listening in. No, this is not gonna work. Tree roots, this is way too close to a tree to be digging a rain garden. The rule of thumb is gonna be, we're gonna look up the tree, we're gonna see how far the branches go out to what's called the drip line, the edge, and we're gonna have an imaginary line that goes down. That is our boundary line. As a rule of thumb, we wanna try not to dig within the drip line of that tree. We wanna dig on the outside of the drip line. And um, there are times when we can risk going within the drip line very carefully, but that's gonna be your rule of thumb. You wanna to try to stay out of that drip line at all costs. That's gonna to be to avoid hurting the tree, to avoid killing the tree. Some trees are very sensitive to digging um, or some trees are not at all sensitive. Uh, silver maple is a great example. You can dig away and you will not kill the tree, but you will cause the tree to drop a limb on your house. So lots of reasons not to dig within the drip line of a tree. Um, but maybe it would be possible to trench that water farther away from the tree to a place where you could plant. Uh, if you have trees in your property, here's a sort of a schema for you to be thinking about um, where the trees are. That's a great place for a habitat garden. You don't want to be digging, but you could plant. Uh, it's typically not good to have lawn right next to a tree. It's actually better to have a mulched garden area next to the tree. Uh, mowing lawn near trees kills trees oftentimes. Uh, results in damage to trees. Um, so if you've got a tree, that might be a good habitat garden spot. If you've got an open lawn space 10 feet away from your house, that might be the good rain garden spot. So just a way to think about it. All right, here's another quiz. Um, site selection. Here we go. Um, we've got water coming down from a downspout onto the driveway apron. This is the worst thing for rivers, for flooding. Uh, that water goes straight into the public systems where it's an enormous problem. It'd be great to do a rain garden here. Can we? There's an obstacle, right? There's a there's trees already planted here, the arbor vitae. We've got a sidewalk. Can we do it here? It would be really good to do it here in the wintertime. This is a, an example of a slip hazard that water outletting onto a hard surface. Uh, this poor guy just keeps having problems. Um, the answer is quite possibly um, there. Uh, it's not that hard to trench under a sidewalk. This is a narrow one. It would be really nice to put one in that open green space area. You can see a neighbor's AC there. We might be able to buffer the sights and sounds if we can stay off the property line. This would be a good one to try to make it work. We'd be solving a lot of problems. All right, next one. How about here? Oh, like gave the answer soon. Um, this is a very steep space for a rain garden to go. The principle of a rain garden is spread the water out and sink it. So we wanna have a big open flat space. So on a slope, it can be very difficult to get a flat enough space for the rain garden to be able to do its work. So slopes are difficult, not impossible, but I strongly recommend everyone start on the easiest place possible. The smallest rain garden, the easiest space, backyard if you can, start easy, start small so that you can learn safely. And then once you've done one, it's so much easier to do a second one. So always start with the easiest one. Steep slopes is not, it's not the easiest garden to do. Uh, so here's an example. If you, if you do need to do a steep slope, it is possible. It's terracing basically, which people have been terracing slopes for millennia. Uh, and here's an example of it. You can see using rocks to sort of bolster the slope to create the flat area. 
It's a lot of rock. Rock is expensive. Rock is heavy. So again, it's not the place I recommend anyone start. Uh, our next hazards to be thinking about, we want to call mist dig uh, before we do any digging for our infiltration tests. So you can see where the underground lines are. You can figure out the right spot for your rain garden. And then we want to be careful digging near any public utilities, gas, electric, phone, cable, sewer, water. All of these are underground oftentimes in many residences. And uh, we want to be careful to make sure we're not creating problems. Um, in addition, you might have internal lines. So coming from the community system, maybe from your house to your garage, you might have electric lines that are not going to get marked. You might have uh, a sprinkler system that's not going to get marked. So you want to be aware of what's under the ground before you start digging up. Uh, as from the rain barrel talk yesterday, if you have a sprinkler system that's terrible for climate change, I highly recommend you dig up that sprinkler system. Do not worry about damaging it. No reason to be using a sprinkler system anymore. All right, quiz time. So here's a home. Which side is the right spot for the rain garden, the left side or the right side? Feel free to chat in your answers. Uh, what side do you think is the best spot to put a rain garden and why? We'll pause for 20 seconds while you think about it and while you type in. I'll talk a little bit about what we see. On the right side, we've got our driveway as a potential water source. We've got a downspout as a potential water source. We've got an obstacle, a sidewalk in front. On the left side, we've got a tree as a potential obstacle. We've got downspouts on the front. We've got downspouts in the back. We've got an open lawn space over here. So, so with that, hopefully you have at least shouted out your thought for left side, right side, as to which is the right answer for the, where the rain garden should go. And the answer is both, actually. Uh, both are great places for a rain garden. This homeowner built it on the left side. And aesthetically, I think the berm is a little sparse up here, so I'd want to see it planted a little bit more deeply. But we've got some beautiful beatrice blooming in here and maybe even some goldenrod back there. The right side would also work. You've got a tunnel under the sidewalk, so it's a little bit more difficult, but there's a nice open space. It's maybe a little bit steeper here, but I think it's not too steep for a rain garden. So that's also a great spot for a rain garden to go. So that's our where. We've got 12 minutes left for the how to build a rain garden. It's a lot to cover. I'm um, gonna see if anyone's got any questions on where. And I don't see Q and A's with where questions. So I'm gonna move on to how, and then we will wrap up covering all questions at the very end. All right, how now the how to dig a rain garden, sizing, digging, planting. And I will say at the start, this is a lot of information to take in. I don't expect anyone to come away mastering all this information. It's your first intro. So do look up the Master Rain Gardener training manual and uh, feel free to hire me for a consultation or get on the Master Rain Gardener Facebook group and start posting your questions on there. This is not the end of the conversation. So sizing, how big should a rain garden be? Um, rules of thumb, 20% and six inch depth. Those are your rules of thumb and I will explain what that means now. So the first thing we wanna do is figure out what your water source is gonna be. Uh, maybe it's gonna be this one downspout here. Maybe it's gonna be the blue downspout or the back downspout over there. I, I highly recommend picking just one downspout. Again, starting as small as possible. Once you pick that one downspout, we're gonna measure the area of the roof that is draining to that downspout. So the pink line here and then the pink line going back. Um, viewed from above, here we go. Here it is viewed from above. The pink area is our area that's gonna be draining into that downspout. We're gonna measure that. And then the 20% rule is basically 20% of that area is gonna be the size of the garden recommended. Oops. So say for example, say this is a 100 square foot area of roof, then the rain garden would be about 20 square feet. If this is a 300 square foot area of roof, then it would be about a 60 square foot rain garden. And we'd be digging that rain garden about six inches deep. So that's our rule of thumb. And by six inches deep, I mean six inches of ponding water in that garden. That is our rule of thumb that works for the vast majority of rain gardens in Southeast Michigan. These are conservative design standards. Uh, they will work for you over the past 10 years, 12 years of master rain gardener, thousands of rain gardens built. There've been a grand total of about three rain gardens that have failed. And those have been fixable and have been fixed. So this will work for you. There are some exceptions though, clay and sand. So stay tuned for those exceptions. Um, so how big should it be? It ends up being for most people about as big as a parking space, which is about 150 to 200 square feet. Um, and so if you don't wanna do the math, if you do it that size, it's probably gonna work. 
Um, here's an example of how small, I often get the question, well, how small can a rain garden be? The smallest I've seen is about one square foot. This is Mallory Wilczewski's backyard. You can see the hard area, the patio, little teeny tiny patio. I think she's in a little condo there. And you can see that little strip of rain garden and it's about 20% of the size of that patio. Perfect sizing relationship there. You can see tiny rain gardens work and it's way better to do lots of little rain gardens than one giant rain garden. So that is our rule of thumb for sizing. Now, I mentioned clay and sand are a little bit different. We adjust the 20% six inch deep rule a little bit. So if you've got clay soil and you can see somebody thumbing the soil there and it's kind of like clay pot, uh, the soil is staying together. If you do a soil infiltration test that will give you um, guidelines about whether it's clay or not, if in doubt, um, go in by the clay design standards. For clay, we do it bigger, we do it 30%. So a little larger, we're spreading that water out over a wider surface and we do it more shallow, just three inches deep. And that's because we wanna make sure that water drains within 24 to 48 hours. We've got it a little bit less shallow. It's not gonna take as long for it to drain away. And when we do the rain garden with this three inch depth, after you dig it to three inches, you're gonna add mulch in. We typically add about three inches of mulch in. So for a clay rain garden, it actually doesn't look like there's much of any standing water in it at all, but it's still in there and it's doing its work. If you are blessed with really sandy soil, I showed the Plymouth Municipal Yard at the start, which had beach sand, then you can get away with a smaller rain garden and a deeper rain garden if you choose. So as small as 10% and as deep as nine inches works great and can't fail um, with sandy soils. Or for many of us, the reality is we don't have this much space and we can't hit the 20% rule, we can't hit the 30% rule. It's okay to do undersized rain gardens. You'll probably wanna talk about it with an expert, but uh, undersized can work. Uh, oftentimes it's a situation of making something that's at least better than what you've got. An undersized rain garden is probably gonna be better than no rain garden. So if you're in that situation, you don't have space for this, talk to an expert, talk to the Master Rain Gardener Facebook group, get feedback. All right, example of digging. This is the way to dig to um, save yourself, save your back, make it as easy as possible. We try to, along our imaginary slope, we dig on the upslope side, and then we pile on the downslope side, creating a berm on that downslope side. And ideally, if we do it right, we use up all the soil. So like I showed you at the very start, the question about what to do with the soil, if we do it right, we use all that soil up no problem. And we're going to use a line level or there's other ways to measure elevations to keep ourselves honest so that we keep that basin flat across. The biggest error I see in people making rain gardens is that they don't dig down deep enough in the back area. It ends up not being flat. The water pools in the front. If we're not spreading that water across the full basin, the rain garden is not working at its best. And then here you can see the three to six inches of ponding water in that rain garden before it overflows over the berm. That's what it looks like to dig out a rain garden. So here is Brenda Dietrich's um, garden after she dug it out, before she planted it. She's in Gross Point Farms and you can see that ideal rain garden where she dug out the bottom and then she piled on the downslope to create the berm. You can see that topography in there for her rain garden. Last thing on digging, um, and this, this is a little hard to cover quickly, so don't worry if this doesn't make sense to you. Um, the reality is soil comes in layers. You, you probably heard the term topsoil. Uh, in addition to topsoil, there's subsoil underneath it. Topsoil is typically our best soil for plants. It's got more organic matter in it. It's darker in color. Oftentimes it's sandier in texture. It's just nicer soil. And when you're planting gardens and garden soil, that topsoil, that's your good growing media. So the thing to watch out for when you're digging a rain garden, and you can see it here, is that if we just dig down our three to six inches and throw that soil away, oftentimes we've actually removed our good soil and we're planting in the junky subsoil below. And so it's really good to actually dig out the topsoil set it aside, save it, and then dig a little deeper. Dig out the subsoil. That's the subsoil is what you're going to get rid of and then pile your topsoil back into the garden. So that way you've got good soil on the bottom of your rain garden. And if you've got good topsoil to start, you can just reuse it. If you've got bad topsoil, then you might think about adding some compost in there, whether it's clayey topsoil or sandy topsoil. Compost solves all of life's problems and will make the garden drain well. All right, I've got five minutes left. We're going to get into rain garden plants and then we'll open it up to Q&A um, after that. And I will get through it. Don't you worry. Rain garden plants. So the thing to take away about rain gardens is it is a tough life for a plant in a rain garden. It's got to be able to absorb three to six inches of ponding water. And in addition to that, oh, it's not a 
It's not a water garden, right? So it does drain within 24 to 48 hours. It's also got to deal with drought in the summertime. We might not get rain for two or three weeks and you don't want to have to be out there watering the garden. So the hallmark of a rain garden plant is one that can handle both the wet and the dry. And I am glad to share with you that on our website, the rouge.org slash plants, you will find plant lists. If you are not a gardener, you're not comfortable with plants, go to the top 20 most reliable plants for rain gardens, pick out just a couple plants, the fewer, the better actually, mass planting almost always looks better. Pick out a couple plants that look good and you will be fine. These reliable plants work in almost every rain garden. If you are more of a gardener, you're comfortable with plant lists, use the recommended plant list downloadable spreadsheet and you will see plants organized by sun, um, by shade, and uh, you'll get great advice on there. And then if you wanna be using non-native plants, we even have a list of non-native plants that may work in rain gardens. It's not been tested though. So you will be the one testing that out. The recommended native plant list has been tested for over 10 years at this point. These plants work. And as we zoom into that plant list, I'm gonna show you um, that there's this moisture column. And this is the key detail in that big plant list when it comes to designing a rain garden, designing the planting plan for your rain garden. And you do wanna do this last. You want to, oh, and then in addition to the moisture, there's also great comments on there um, based on people's experiences for how the plants perform. So a lot of great information in that. So when it comes to planting a rain garden, there are three major zones. There's the basin bottom, there's the side slope, and then there's the upper area next to the rain garden. These are our three zones to be thinking about. The bottom is the one that's most different, the one you're least familiar with planting. That's our wet zone. That's going to be where the water is ponding. And, um, the range in here depends on your soils and how much water is coming into the garden, but it's typically M MSW in that range. So to go back to here, uh, the moisture list, we've got D, M, M, S, and W, dry, medium, moist, and wet. So we're giving you the range that these plants can tolerate. So you wanna pick a plant that can survive in that area. The wider range, the plant can handle, the more resilient it's gonna be. So if you've got a plant that's just a W, it's probably gonna be right near outlet where the water is coming in, or it's going to be really good for a garden that's got a little bit of clay in it. Um, if it's a plant that can only go up to M, it's maybe not a basin bottom plant, except if you've got like sandy, a really sandy rain garden, an M plant can do well on the bottom of a sandy rain garden. Side slope gets a little bit drier, upland area next to it gets a little bit drier still. And if there's a plant you really want to have go in your rain garden, but it just can't handle the water, just put it in the upper area next to it. So if you want spring ephemerals, you want tulips, um, plants like that that are bulbs that don't like wet, just put them in the berm next to the rain garden or to the side of the rain garden or behind the rain garden. Um, you can get all kinds of plants around the rain garden. Um, here are some pictures showing some common wet zone plants. And I show these just because, again, that wet zone is the most unfamiliar. These are mostly native plants. We do have a non-native astilbe on here. I've got them organized by sun, shade, and then there's the both column in the middle, that wild iris, umbrella sedge, actually fox sedge too. These are invincible plants in rain gardens. They can handle full sun, full shade. They can handle three inches of water most of the year. They can handle drought. So these are our go-to invincible plants on the bottom, great ground cover textures. And then there's also a bunch of other great, beautiful native plants in here um, from the lobelias, blue lobelia, cardinal flower ferns, maiden fern, ostrich fern, sensitive fern, swamp milkweed, beautiful, beautiful native plants that look great in rain gardens. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, we'll have Ann House send us off showing off her beautiful rain garden in Plymouth Township, um, solving drainage problems, helping our river out. She is solving problems and you can too. If you like what you've heard today, please visit the rouge.org slash member. Become a member. We are a membership organization. You too can be a part of our vision of making pure North, uh, pure Michigan right here in our own backyards. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, thanks again to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Thanks to you for being here with us for Rain Gardens 101. Get your lawn a job. Door prize, um, please visit the rouge.org slash eval dash rg 101. That is the course evaluation. I'd love your feedback. Let us know what worked, what didn't work for you. At the end of the evaluation, you'll get a link to where you can enter the door prize drawing. And so with that, I am going to look at the Q&A now. Let's head from the start to the finish with the Q&A. Jen asked, how close can you plant next to the house? Um, the answer is try to keep the rain garden 10 feet away. You can have the side slope closer to the house than that. Uh, she says she doesn't know how to grade the land near her house so it would go up 
over or right up to the basement windows. I was hoping I could solve our sometimes wet basement with plants that don't have roots that could damage the foundation, but could soak up the extra water. So the key, so oftentimes people cannot, like Jen, add soil next to the house because you don't wanna cause more problems. If you pile more soil next to your basement foundation, you get beyond the waterproofing layer, you create big problems. So it's a huge problem for people that have great issues next to their home. They can't raise the soil next to the house, but what you can do is you can lower the soil farther away from your house. So when you dig that rain garden down three to six inches, that's creating grades. So you can pipe the water to that rain garden more easily. So rain garden oftentimes helps you get the water away from that foundation more readily because you're creating topography, you're digging deeper. And if that three to six inches is not enough, that doesn't create enough topography, you can dig the garden a little bit deeper. Um, just want to try to make sure that the garden has an outlet that the water can get out of the garden still that it's not going to fill up so deep with water. Um, so Jen, yes, a rain garden can help solve that problem potentially. Let's see, next we've got an anonymous attendee. Can you make a rain garden without the rain gutter water going to it? And the answer is, you know, if, whether it's driveway water or it's sidewalk water, yes, or maybe you could have a swale guiding the water in there. But if you don't have that water source, it's not a rain garden, it's just a garden. Peggy Harp asks, I have sandy soil, but I only have a rain garden if I have an issue with flooding. I oftentimes get that. Um, Peggy, you are in such glorious shape with your sandy soil. I would think about your rain garden as probably not solving problems for you unless you have water in the basement. People with sandy soils oftentimes get more water in the basement. So if, if you do have that, then the rain garden might help get the water away from your foundation. Peggy, think about yourself. I actually forgot to mention this earlier. The golden rule of watersheds is do unto those downstream from you as you would have those upstream do unto you. So your rain garden is gonna be super easy to dig. It's so easy to dig in sand. Your rain garden is gonna perform. You can make it small and it's still gonna just soak up that water in an instant. You are helping everyone downstream from you. So keep that water off from your driveway out of the street. See if you can get the water off your driveway and onto your sandy soil. Uh, even your downspouts, you might not see water running off of your lawn because the water is so sandy. But think about the next time a 100 year store comes when five, year, or five inches of water comes down, um, even with sandy soil, you're gonna get some water runoff there. So it still makes sense to design a rain garden to soak that water up. So with sandy soil, it's the easiest place to build a rain garden. It's the most impactful. That Plymouth Municipal Yard Garden at the start was on sand and we were able to get water out of the sewer system onto the sand and soak up prob uh, water solving problems. Next question is Scott Morgan. Could you provide a top three of plants to absorb, remove water, and attract pollinators? Native is preferable, but reasonably available at local stores is also an important consideration. Man, I, I got that question from the pollinator class, and the reality is that um, from a pollinator standpoint, like each pollinator is going to have a different answer. It's going to say, oh, my favorite plant is the one that my caterpillars can eat. So, so it's really better to think about what pollinator you're thinking of specifically. At that point, you can come up with a top three list for pollinators. Um, so maybe you're thinking about hummingbirds specifically. Maybe you're thinking about a specific kind of butterfly. Um, so a top three list is going to depend on the species you're targeting. But in terms of absorbing and removing water, um, I can give you at least a rule of thumb for the best plants to absorb, remove water. Wetland plants are going to be our best, really. So um, some of the sedges that I mentioned earlier, they survive the water. Wetland plants are going to really help send the water up into the air. Plants actually breathe water into the air. Wetland plants do a really good job of that. And then sometimes if you've got clay ear soils, um, plants that have tap roots will actually also oftentimes work better because they punch through that clay better to help the water drain in. So there's no universal top three list, Scott. It's situational depending on your garden space and depending on your goals. Next question is from Terry Landrup. I have a large area in the backyard that is full of water, similar to the photo that I showed earlier of my backyard. I want a rain garden that will absorb the water and create habitat for birds, bees, and butterflies. I'd even like to keep and incorporate a water feature. I think the previous owners already put some sort of drainage that pulls the water away from the house to our lake. Where do I start? How do I find a professional? So um, our website, therouge.org, has a professionals list. I'll also say Washington County, um, the Master Rain Garden Program has an even better professional list than ours. It's larger and they've been maintaining it better than I have. Um, so I would look to one of those to find a professional. Um, and the key for where to start 
is oftentimes it's better to rather than building one big one at the bottom uh, for my home I showed you know, where that water was sure I did two down there in that bottom bit but I also farther upstream where my driveway was draining down there I built another one up by the driveway I ripped up asphalt back there that was causing the problem. So the rule of thumb is going to be when you've got a flooding issue in your yard is look upstream, look upstream, go to the sources of the water that's causing the flooding issue and build your rain gardens as far upstream as you can, several small upstream rather than starting in that big wet low spot. If you can build it higher up, that is going to be the better solution, several small higher up um, breaking apart that hard area that's draining and causing the flooding issue. That's going to be your best bet. That's how I would think about getting started. But feel free, if you want to have a consultation, we can talk it through um, more. Um, moving on, Scott asked the question, are there good combos with porous pavement and rain gardens, particularly where rain gardens would not otherwise be okay? I did not talk about porous pavements in this class today, but it's good for everyone to know that yes, you can have a hard surface, like your driveway especially, is oftentimes the best place for porous pavements, porous uh, pavers, there's porous asphalt, there's porous concrete. These are hard surfaces. Even though they're hard, the water can still drain through them as though it were a soft surface. Great new technologies, they work great. They um, don't ice up in the wintertime because the water doesn't sit there, it still drains in. So um, they are solving problems. They last longer because they don't have freeze thaw issues the way that traditional pavements do. And also they look great, especially the permeable pavers, they raise property values. So if you're redoing your driveway, I highly recommend you look into permeable pavers as a solution. They'll probably cost twice as much, but they'll last twice as long. So it's kind of the same considerations for like a metal roof uh, at your home. Um, and so, yeah, they oftentimes pair very nicely together. It's smart to integrate these things together as you can. Um, beyond that, it would be looking at the situation to figure out the best configuration. Uh, Scott had a follow-up question. Backyard seems to be the best option for rain gardens. Uh, I've seen a number of signs that say rain garden. It seemed mostly helpful in the front. Is there a reasonable way to educate people about rain gardens that are in the back? Um, Front yard rain gardens are the gold standard for public education. Backyard rain gardens, stay tuned. I have an incredible resource that we're about to unveil anytime on which you can put information about your backyard rain garden to help educate your friends and neighbors. So stay tuned for that. That is gonna be available. And uh, even your backyard rain garden can be educational. James Meek asked, can you still use a dry well in clay soil along with a rain garden? You can, James but it's not gonna do that much. The cost benefit is just really not there for it. So it's really only gonna be if you have an incredibly difficult situation where it really makes sense to spend every penny you can, um, where it might make sense to use the dry well too, or possibly I've seen, I've seen one situation where a downspout comes down, you've got like 12 feet past, um, of green space, you really don't want to have the rain garden within the 10 feet. And so you've got like this two foot little strip. So maybe it makes sense in that two foot little strip to sneak a dry well in there. Something like that might make sense, but the dry wells just really don't perform well in clay. Uh, at my house, um, they put in a dry well to take some pump water um, and it just never drains. So I put a rain garden next to it. So my dry well now overflows into my rain garden. And like I said, it's just, it's never once dried out. Um, I think about ever since I moved in, <laughs> the dry well just does not work in uh, in clay soils. So it's it just really I, I I can't recommend them in clay. Scott, is there a depth of digging that is safe to not call this dig? No, there is not a depth of digging that is safe to not call this dig, because the reality is that. Um, you have no idea whether the people that installed your gas line, your electric line, uh, your other lines, whether they did it right. Uh, there's supposed to be at least an 18 inch of soil cover uh, over those features. So supposedly there's going to be an 18 inch clearance where it would be safe digging, but it just doesn't always get done right. You might have that clearance. It might not be there. It might be much more shallow. And so you might bust open a line while you're digging. And if you don't call this dig, and you bust open a line, you are responsible for paying for a very expensive repair. Whereas if you call Miss Dig and then uh, you find out they mark it, the line here, but the actual line was way over here because sometimes they mark it wrong too. If you bust it then, you are not responsible for paying for it. If they mark it and they mark it wrong and you bust a line, they are responsible for paying for it. So Miss Dig is gonna 
uh, give you peace of mind. It's potentially going to save you a whole lot of money. And it's really helpful for planning. Uh, when you're digging that infiltration test, call Mystic. Then you will see all the lines marked, and then you'll know. So you can plan to avoid those lines. Next question is from Paul Schweiger, and we are getting to the end of the questions here. We'll see if there's any questions in the chat or any in Facebook Live. Paul asks, if I have clay soil and it can only be three inches deep, how will the gutter downspout work? Won't it be exposed along the path to the rain garden? That's a very good question. Um, I really like pop-up emitters. I showed them on uh, one picture. Uh, I don't think I can pull it up in the few minutes we've got left. So um, search the internet for pop-up emitter. Um, the way it works basically, um, so the pipes are typically four inches deep. You want a two inch cover of um, soil on top of that for uh, grass to grow successfully. So we're talking six inches deep. The pipe is gonna go underground. It's gonna drop a little bit along the run. And then a pop-up emitter basically restores that drop and grade. It's gonna pop back up um, to the soil surface and then the water can drain, can drain into the garden itself. So a pop-up emitter is the way to get that elevation back so that the water can drain in. Um, otherwise, you might have to dig a little deeper, or maybe it's gonna make sense to have the water actually travel along the surface of the soil in a swale to get there. So, um, so the answer, Paul, is a pop-up emitter is your friend. Take a look and see if you can make that work for you. Amber McCurtis asks, if you notice water puddling in an area of your yard, is that a good sign that a rain garden would be beneficial there? Very common question. You see a water puddle, is that where the rain garden goes? The answer to that is, Oftentimes, no. Sometimes, yes, but perhaps more often even not. Uh, people sometimes have um, clay lenses in their yard. Sometimes they've got sand lenses in different places. Michigan was glaciated. Our soils are crazy. Um, they are wild, wild soils. And so if you've got a super wet spot, it might be because you've got a clay lens there. That might be the worst place to put a rain garden. So uh, as per the, the question at the very start that kicked us off, um, see where that puddle is and then trace upstream. Find where the water is coming from. Find the downspouts. Get 10 feet away from your house investigate right there. 10 feet away from your house is often the best place for the rain garden. Think about it as keeping the water out of the wet spot rather than planting the rain garden in the wet spot. Um, investigate up there, you might find a better situation. Sometimes people here in Southeast Michigan, especially the Canton area, we've got high water tables as well. So often that low spot, sometimes the reason why it's especially wet is because it's lower, the water table is closer to the surface and it doesn't drain as well. So looking farther upstream, closer to the house, 10 feet away, but closer to the house is oftentimes your best space for several small rain garden features, keeping water out of that low wet spot. Try that first. And if that doesn't dry up that low wet spot, then at that point, I would think about maybe adding another feature in that low wet spot um, to manage the water there. Okay, so those are all the questions in the q and I'm going to look back at the chat and um, see if there's anything from Facebook Live. And uh, we're getting to the end of the Q&A feature here. Um, I'll go for maybe just a couple more minutes, um, about 1.15 or so, maybe a minute or two past that. Um, and then uh, we will close things up here. I see Jennifer is asking, that uh, Master Rain Gardener class finished in April. Will you be offering another one? Yes, uh, we will offer it in October in Oakland County, location TBD. And um, you will probably receive an announcement now for having signed up for this class. Um, James Meek uh, says, thanks to the new build next to me, the water heads to my lawn, no piping needed. That is a really unfortunate situation. Um, I, I really wish that people would be responsible for the water on their property. And it's one where you can be an advocate. Some communities require people to be responsible for the water on their properties. Ann Arbor, for example, if you're building a new area of hard surface, 200 square feet or larger, so it's an expansion to your building or a new driveway, you are required to do a rain garden. So um, look into that, advocate in your community for something like that. You should not have to deal with somebody else's water, but the reality is many people are. And so if you need to do something about it, maybe your property is the right place to do it. Um, but most of the time, it's going to be better if that neighbor can manage the water on their property. They don't always like to listen. Uh, that's often a very awkward, potentially a threatening conversation. So my typical recommendation is do something on your property, design a rain garden on your property to manage your water. And then you've got a showpiece. You can say, hey, neighbor, look, 
I just built this rain garden to salt the water on my property. It's not enough. I still have a water problem. Can we see about doing something on your property to soak up the water? At that point, you've got a demonstration. It's not the scary unknown thing. They can see it looks good. It makes the conversation much easier. They might not listen still, but that's the best place to start for that. Uh, I see people answering my quizzes as I went through. Amy asks, if you have a space in your backyard that is shaded and collects water, is that a good place to start a rain garden? Maybe is the answer to that. There might be tree cover there. The shaded spot oftentimes has the tree cover. And so it might be difficult to dig the rain garden out if there's tree cover there. But if it's next to the tree, but still shaded by the tree, that could be a good place to build the rain garden. There are ways to do rain gardens under trees. They are difficult to do though. And it involves using berms. That's gonna be one that would take consultation to discuss um, because they are not common and they're difficult to do. All right, I'm seeing lots of thank yous from folks. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to have you. Debbie, so glad to have you here. Lucia, so grateful you could join us. Jen, Peggy. Um, Terry, thank you for joining us. Sharon, Amber, so glad you could all join us today. That is it on the chat for questions. That's it on the Q&A. Um, thank you so much. Um, please think once more about becoming a member. Your membership supports programs like this, makes this possible for others in the future as we're working to bring your friends, your neighbors, your community into being part of the solution here as we work towards our clean water future, as we work to make pure Michigan right in our own backyards. Thank you so much. Um, I wish you all a wonderful day. Don't forget the rouge.org slash eval dash RG 101. And I will try to drop that into the chat before I shut things down here. I'm typing it in over here. Let's see if I can pull this off. Dropping it into the chat. Let's see if that link works. To get you to that eval, it does work. All right, so there you go. You've got a link. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to everyone who shared questions. Thank you for being a part of Earth Day with Friends of the Rouge. Thank you for being a part of Earth Week. Um, be well, do good things. So long.